Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's show. The date is Monday the 27th of April 2020. It is 7pm here in Melbourne. We are live on the Wilmsfront YouTube channel. It is also 10am in the UK. Uh, Hello to uh, everybody uh, in the uh, chat who've uh, been waiting. Uh, We are also uh, live on Entropy. A lot of people who uh, are tuning in will be familiar with Entropy. It's the the YouTube interactive software uh, where you are put the link in the live chat. It's also in the description. If you want to ask myself or Laura tonight a question, uh, you can use the the Entropy link. And we are also broadcasting live to my DLive channel as well. So over the past decade in Western nations, we've seen a resurgence in nationalism, both in activism and public sentiment. We've seen various personalities, leaders, organizations emerge uh, during that time who've all made a significant uh, contribution to the cause. But it's no doubt it's been a bumpy ride, especially with the entire political establishment against you. And nowhere is the political established more against nationalists and patriots than in Britain. It has imprisoned nationalist activists, the media has slandered and defamed them, and social media has unpersoned them. The urgency of the uh, continued demographic change in the UK and uh, increasing marginalization and discrimination of the British Indigenous people has seen a new breed of patriot activists emerge over the past year to take on uh, these threats to the future of Britain as we know it in a more open and forthright manner in terms of uh, speaking about the the issues. This has seen uh, British nationalist activism go a bit back to the future with Mark Collett, a former British National Party activist and candidate emerging as the main face of this uh, new evolution of British nationalism. We had Mark on the Uncuckables at the end of 2019 to discuss the launch of Patriotic Alternative. My guest on Wilms Front uh, tonight is Laura Towler, who has become Mark Collette's uh, reliable right-hand woman at Patriotic Alternative and has made regular appearances on Mark's Patriotic Weekly Review interactive live show. However, she is a successful vlogger in her own right, not just on YouTube, but BitChute as well, which is no easy feat and also has a large following on Twitter and Telegram. Patriot Alternative hasn't been able to proceed with its regional meetings uh, as planned because of the coronavirus pandemic and national lockdown in the UK, but uh, they were able to hold their second successful conference just before the pandemic reached the nation. Uh, we had uh, scheduled, uh, penciled in this uh, interview uh, with Laura a while back, uh, but she's had some trouble uh, getting the, the a proper internet connection uh, 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 where uh, she is currently uh, residing, but I'm glad that I finally have the the opportunity to to chat with her, uh, learn, learn more about her, and also the the state of things in in not just Britain in general, but under the the coronavirus uh, lockdown. So, Laura, welcome to Wilmsfront. Hello, Tim. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's lovely to finally speak with you, and I'm sorry I, I had to rearrange it just been a nightmare. I moved house two months ago and I haven't, I still haven't got the internet and I, I didn't want to rearrange with, with you again. So I've connected to the internet on my phone. So if we do get cut off today, I'll come straight back. It's prob- probably just not a very strong connection. Uh, but yeah, it's been a nightmare not having the internet for two months and not being able to get any work done. Uh, but yeah, and also just hello to everyone in the chat as well. I see a lot of familiar names. I did post the stream on Twitter, so I'm guessing some people followed me over. But yeah, thanks for having me. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. I can imagine how hard it would be <laughs> during the, the lockdown to get somebody out to your uh, place to, to get the, the internet or they might be pulled over by the police on the way or, 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 or something with 
in, in Australia, we get uh, the, the lockdown lunacy uh, stories, as, it, as it's uh, called, from all around the, the, the world, and uh, we'll get into it later. But, of course, the UK police, uh, they always uh, take the prize. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of people have said that there have been more police walking about lately. Uh, and I've noticed it too, because I'm not sure what the situation is in Australia, but we're allowed to go for one walk a day. So me and my fiance usually go for a, a walk into the countryside or around the park and there's police everywhere. And I don't think they've got anything to do because um, the, the official crime statistics in Britain say that, that crime has dropped during the coronavirus lockdown and obviously that's because everybody's just locked up in their houses but they're just going after the most ridiculous things they've been checking people's shopping bags to make sure that what they've bought is essential and that people are going out to buy essential things so yeah not having the internet straight after the conference as well because we had the PA conference on the Saturday and there's been such a hype about patriotic alternatives since then and then I moved house on the Wednesday and having no internet and usually in this situation I'd go to my grandma's house and just work from my grandma's house but then we're not allowed to do that because of coronavirus so I've just been trying to connect to my phone every now and again and you know write some articles or try and make a video and upload, upload it by using the data on my phone but it's I don't get unlimited unlimited data and it's not a very strong connection so but yeah hopefully the stream will go okay but if I do disappear just keep talking and I'll just restart and log back in and hopefully that won't happen anyway. Sounds like if you did decide to work from your uh, uh, grandmother's there, there, there might be a, a full SWAT team who might come in and look for you uh, in the attic. <laughs> the, the, what you've just said, checking people shopping and you're only allowed yeah, out once a day. And, and they'd love that. <clears throat> they'd love to catch two, two prominent hate figures as well because my, my grandma's also part of the nationalist community. And she's done two uh, interviews with me on YouTube and everybody says Grandma Towler's far right and all that stuff. It's a bit of a meme. So, yeah, I'm sure they'd love to sweep down and, and get me and Grandma Towler at the same time. Now, that's a common theme with you and Mark. You both come from nationalist uh, families, which which I'm sure your, your critics hate because uh, uh, they'd like to, to think that... Uh, People such as you and 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 Mark, your your families uh, will disown you because of such your horrible uh, views. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting one because when I first got involved in all this, people were saying, "What does your mum think of this? What does your family think of this? We're gonna we're gonna find out who they are and tell them." And it's like you have no idea. Our views are the majority, and I come from a working class background. And everyone in the village where I'm from just has the same views as me. People are sick of immigration. People are sick of getting the bus to work and not hearing anyone speaking English. People are sick of having no relationship with their neighbours. And I can say all the things I say on YouTube to anyone in my village and they don't care. They have the same views as me. So they think that we're the anomaly. But once you get out of that little London sort of metropolitan bubble, you'll find that they're the anomaly and most people aren't offended by the things that we say. So th there are just so many people who have these views and who aren't talking about it, but the media don't portray those views as being the norm. So it's a shock to you when you realise that. But I know we're probably going to talk about it in a moment, but Mark and I went out last year with 50 volunteers and surveyed the public on demographics and an overwhelming majority of people agreed with us about these demographics are too much and we shouldn't be on track to becoming a minority in Britain. So we do have the public on side and that's a white pill and uh, something that we're consistently working towards utilising really. And uh, uh... My audience who, who may not have uh, heard you before, you've got a, a very thick, uh, a, as we say, British uh, accent. Uh, it's a, a, as we know, and the the, the the British British accent and sort of language is being uh, maligned. But you also point out you have a a northern uh, dialect as well, from well the north of England. People sort of don't understand that sort of England is divided. Uh, the culture traditionally is very different in the north and the south. Yeah, so there's no such thing as a British accent because Britain is Scotland, Wales and England, <laughs> which are very, very different accents. But in, I, th I think when people say English accent, they usually mean like Mary Poppins, you know, like uh, Dick Van Dyke kind of posh sort of old English. But yeah, it, I mean, it's the same with every country, isn't it? I could probably do a typical American accent and it'd be like the Valley Girl accent, whereas they have lots of different accents. But I'm, uh, I have a, a Yorkshire accent, which is a county in the north of England. 
and then I also have a a working class accent as well so it's a bit of a, a chavy common accent as well I guess but I have no intentions of trying to change that I do pronounce my words properly and I do I won't use slang so I won't say things like summer and no and all because people won't know what I'm talking about but I have no intentions of trying to soften my accent and make it more southern and make it more like the BBC television presenters because it's part of who I am it's a part of my identity and I think it's part of what makes England beautiful the fact that you can travel to Liverpool or Newcastle or Norwich or London or Oxford and everyone has a different accent and we all have different sort of little traditions in our villages and cities and stuff and yeah I love that so I have no intention of trying to to lose it but I was actually quite nervous about starting on YouTube I thought people aren't gonna understand my Yorkshire accent but most people I would say probably nine out of ten people seem to to like it it's a little bit different I guess so <laughs> yeah well it sounds authentic uh, and I think that's why you've you've grown uh so much and uh, and, and so people know that it's coming just, uh, they feel it's coming from an, an ordinary uh, person. Uh, 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 you're, uh, you're, uh, you just go through in your, in your videos, just the, the, the facts and, and, and figures. You, you don't aim to be outrageous like some other uh, YouTubers, or I should also say bit, bit shooters as well. Yeah, I am just me. Uh, I, I don't... I, I have a lot of flaws, obviously, because I'm a human being and we all have flaws, but I am I am just a real person, you know, I don't pretend to be something that I'm not. And I think people can relate to that because, like I said, on the TV, you have this kind of posh sort of BBC, maybe a Kent, maybe West London kind of accent that you hear all the time. And you don't often hear a Northern accent. So I think when people hear that, uh, they just think, oh, wow, just a normal, <laughs> a normal working class person. And it seems to it seems to work in my favour, I think. But like I said, I have no intentions of changing it. It's it's part of who I am. One of your vlogs, you talked about how you were previously in the, the counter jihad uh, movement, uh, which uh, I, I guess to uh, explain, uh, give it give a bit more of an explanation of what what that is. It, it's it's basically well, not uh, anti-Islam is a, is a too, uh, I, I would say, too simplistic way. It's uh, Islam critical uh, activism and against mass Islamic uh, immigration. So to give uh, uh, some of the people uh, who, uh, who would be the faces of the counter-jihad movement are uh, 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 Robert Spencer, Pamela uh, Geller, uh, and sort of events, so organisations such as the Middle East Forum, which is run by Daniel Pipes, uh, Rebel... Uh, media and the stop uh, is Islamization of uh, America because let's not forget in the the early twenty uh, tens uh, the the cultural impact of of Islam with uh, practices such as female genital uh, mutilation and more uh, publicly the the terror attacks which uh, uh, it's most frequent uh, in the in the UK that was the the most significant threat to. Uh, the West uh, during uh, that time is is that what initially uh, got you involved in the counter jihad movement? Yeah, kind of. I mean, that was obviously a, a big event in two thousand. Was it two thousand and seventeen? I think we had three terror attacks. Uh, we had the Manchester Arena bombing where twenty two people died, and then we had the Westminster attack where five people died, and then we had the London Bridge attack where. Eight people died. I mean, I shouldn't say died. I should say murdered because that's what happens. So it was 35 murders in a single year and it all happened, I think, within spring. So it was all kind of within a few months of each other. And But for me, it began before that uh, because the area where, where I grew up, it's a village in Leeds in Yorkshire and it's completely white. And it's a working class village, but it's, it's very English and we had this community feel. And then when I got a little bit older, I moved to Bradford for a couple of years because my friend was at university there and she said do you want to come and live with me while I'm studying at uni so I was like yeah okay then and Bradford if anyone in the audience has heard of Bradford uh, it's famous for being full of Pakistani Muslims and I think at the last census it was 63% white British but today it's probably around 50% white British and it's one of those areas where some areas are 100% Muslim and some are 100% white 
Uh, and living there, it was just such a wake up call for me because I'd never had any experience of diversity at all. There were a few Pakistani girls in my class at school, but they were lovely. You know, they, you, you could hardly tell, apart from what they looked like, that they were different to us. And then to go and live in an area that was 100% Muslim, I was just like, what is this? It was just an absolute nightmare. And on the first night, we went looking for um, just where the local shops were, you know, to figure out the area and stuff. And we were followed by a group of Pakistani men and they were kind of like getting really close to us, breathing in our face, uh, leaning in towards us. And it was just really seedy and horrible. And during the two years I lived in Bradford, this encounter happened. I'm not even exaggerating thousands of times. There were just thousands of encounters where we were followed home. We were grabbed. We were spat at. We were told uh, you guys are white slags. You're not allowed in this area. We were offered money for sex in broad daylight when I remember I was only a teenager at the time. I was wearing like a pair of jeans and a parka coat and some old guy came over and he was like sex, £10. And I was just like, well, I'm just a kid. Um, and it was just, yeah, it was just a nightmare. There were times when we were physically chased and one time we had to run into a shop and phone the police and the police came and picked us up and drove us home. And that was my first experience of multiculturalism. And I was like, what is going on here? What is the problem? Is it an Islam thing? Is it a, a racial thing? Is it a cultural thing? And then because I'm in Yorkshire, you've probably heard of cities in Yorkshire, including Rotherham, Bradford, Leeds, um, Huddersfield, Sheffield. All these places had major grooming gang scandals. I'm saying grooming gang because we're on YouTube. I don't want to get the stream shut down, but we all know what they really are. And a lot of my... Uh, friends from school were involved in these grooming gangs and then obviously as we said we had the uh, terror attacks in 2017 so all of these things had been committed by muslims so i was like it's islam isn't it islam's the big problem and then it was only over like the couple of years afterwards that i started to look at the bigger picture and i thought to myself it isn't just muslims because if we look at the people in government who were demanding reparations from us it's African Caribbeans. If we look at the people who were carrying out the gang violence in London and the knife crime and the acid attacks, again, it's it's young black males. Um, and if we look at the people who are, you know, overrepresented in the media and, and banking and academia and stuff, again, that's a different group. So I was like, this thing isn't just Islam. It's a racial thing. It's a cultural thing. And I do think Islam plays a part in it as well. I think it's like a three pronged attack on us. Uh, religious, cultural and also racial but I didn't want to stay in that little bubble where they kind of just oversimplified everything and just said everything is Islam, Islam, Islam because it's not just Islam so that's why I moved really from the counter jihad movement who tend to just focus on Islam into nationalism and um, yeah like I said if, if these people disavowed Islam which they're not going to do anyway but say if all the Pakistanis and Bangladeshis disavowed Islam uh, we would still have all these problems because it's deep rooted in who they are. It's a cultural thing. It's a, There are racial differences between us. You can't expect somebody to come over on the boat or aeroplane from Pakistan and then just change who they are on the way over here. So, yeah, for me, I just I didn't think like the counter jihad movement were addressing the issue. Honestly, I felt like they were kind of wrapping themselves in a Islam isn't a race. Therefore, I am not a racist comfort blanket. And they weren't willing to address the issues that the other groups were, were giving us. So, yeah, that was my journey, really, from the beginning to the counter jihad movement to being a, a proper nationalist. Obviously, we've heard in Australia about the, the incidents of anti-white racism and the, the grooming gangs in the UK. But hearing you talk about first first-hand experience uh, with it, it's it's just it, it sounds horrifying. The fact that if you go to a major almost every any major uh, city in the the uk you mentioned a few uh, bradford uh, leeds uh, there's also uh, further uh, south in the midlands uh, blackburn uh, has a, a large muslim population uh, birmingham uh, as well it just sounds from on the ground so much worse than what gets it, it's it's almost like it's we we, we get sort of a filtered uh, version of how bad it is not not the, 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 the full first-hand account. Yeah, it's um, when you've experienced it yourself. I mean, I, I don't want to say that my experiences were as bad as any of the girls who were physically abused. I mean, we had girls who were murdered. 
We had a girl who had her tongue nailed to a table above a takeaway. We had people who were doused in petrol and told, if you tell anybody about this, we're gonna go to, we're gonna uh, kill your family and stuff like that. So I don't want to say, oh, oh, I've been through all this and my experience is just as bad because it wasn't. But I did have these experiences where they they just come right into your face and they like stare at your chest and breathe on you and they feel like they own you. They there was this phrase going around called easy meat because one of the guys who was a groomer. And again, people always tell me off for saying groomer, but I'm using YouTube friendly mm. language. Um, there was one of the guys who said, oh, we chose white girls because they were easy meat. And that is the perception that you get from them because it, it is like they own you and like you're below them. And it's our country. Do you know what I mean? So it was just horrible. I, I remember walking from the top of the street down to the bottom of the street once, which was about a 10 minute walk. Um, and my friend and I were being hassled by Pakistani men. And we counted on the way down how many times we got shouted at or you know, whistled at or some some sort of activity on the way down. And it was about 30 times just walking down one street. And there are areas in Manningham where um, it's just 100% Muslim. And you walk into these areas and you get told this is our area. You're not allowed here. So when we talk about no-go zones, uh, people say oh, there's no such thing as no-go zones because they think it means like government sanctioned areas which are 100% Muslim. That isn't what it's like. It's just areas which over time have become 100% Muslim. And if you go there, you are by law allowed to go there. But if you go there in person, you'll realise that you're not allowed to go there. And it's because they own those, those cities now temporarily. We're going to try and do something about that. But that's what it's like. Uh, sort of enter uh, at your own risk. Uh, obviously, with the uh, increasing Islamization of of Britain in the in the twenty first uh, century, Tommy Robinson emerged as probably the most preeminent uh, British nationalist. He he founded first the the English uh, Defence League, and he's he's moved from uh, uh, being a part of various uh, uh, organisations and and media uh, outlets. He he as tried to, to simplify his uh, message uh, to focus on uh, the, the the problems and the 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 threat to to British uh, freedom and culture uh, from uh, Islam but he came at it from a, a different a, a different political uh, perspective he he was sort of appealing to the liberal Demo Democrats not the party I mean the the ideology and the postmodern are saying that if you want this uh, postmodern uh, utopia a, a liberal uh, society where women are, are able to to live their lives has as they say they see fit and uh, gay and, and lesbian people are allowed to enjoy their freedom you can't have uh, Islam that that was that was his pitch uh, to the the British people and uh, th this was uh, back in well, 2011 he was basically my red pill from being just a going with the postmodernist flow to realizing hey we can't have all, all this sort of postmodern stuff if you've got an increasing uh, Islamic uh, culture with all of its uh, practices that run uh, counter to it and that that uh, he reached a lot of of people uh, with that, but as we've as we've seen, uh, he was still uh, battered uh, by the the mainstream media and the uh, uh, the political establishment. Uh, conservative British Prime Minister David Cameron called the EDL sick. Uh, it certainly didn't save him from uh, being called a, a fascist and bigot and all other things and hope not hate hate, which uh, is your preeminent. Uh, anti-fascist group uh, going after him and his associates and trying to ruin their lives. Yeah, Tommy Robinson's a, an interesting one because I, I was also quite a big fan of him a few years ago when I was involved in the counter-jihad movement. But I think over time, as I've learned more and, and grown up, I, I've just kind of realised that he's focusing attention towards one issue and focusing or diverting purposely, potentially, attention away from other things that matter and people seem to think that I have this beef with him and I, you know I'm him and I are enemies I've never actually said anything negative about him other than um he once made a video where he had a bit of a a meltdown about me Mark and Chris I think Chris is in the chat he was earlier um where he gave some statistics about demographics for Luton and in the video he was saying that the replacement the demographic replacement which is happening is entirely Islamic uh, and the statistics that he gave were false. 
So I just responded to his video and I didn't say anything personal about him, but I just said, actually, these statistics are not true. Here are the correct ones. And I showed that the replacement that we're experiencing in Luton and many other cities across Britain is not just Islamic, it's um, African Caribbean as well. And also in some places, the white other population is increasing. So like the Polish, for example, the Polish are actually the largest ethnic group in Britain, apart from the white British. So I felt like he was simplifying the issue, saying it's just Islam, it's just Islam. And I was like, well, actually, no, look at these cities where it's African Caribbeans who were replacing us. So I just didn't feel like he was being honest with his audience when he did that. Uh, but again, I, I've never said anything personal about him. I think he has done good, good stuff, uh, pulling people over to real nationalism. But I think once you start counter signaling people who are further to the right of you and people who are trying to tell the truth and get to the the core point of the issue, once you start slagging off those people, it makes me go off you, to be honest, because I think, what's your intention here? Why are you involved in this? Uh, and I, I do think he's done good work, but I also do think that he, he does kind of, I mean, he called us all white supremacists because we were saying that we're being replaced in our own country, which is ridiculous. You know, we don't think we're superior to anyone else. We don't want to rule over anyone else. We just want a Britain for the British. So yeah, I, I don't have any beef with him. And he, if he ever wants to talk to me, I would happily talk to him. But I've, I've offered him a debate a few times and he's never responded. So <laughs> yeah. He referred to you as uh, some bird in his uh, rant against uh, you, uh, Chris. And Mark, I actually didn't come across uh, Mark Collette until it was the the TR News uh, channel did an expose uh, on him uh, from the, those two documentaries that uh, he he did in the summer of uh, 2002, which obviously he didn't decide the title, but there was Russell Brand's Nazi Boy and the the, the Channel Four One Young uh, Nazi and Proud, but it had the effect of basically. When you, uh, when you do think you're doing an expose on somebody, it can actually have the, the opposite effect and people research who is this Mark Collette and then they find that he's also got a, a social media uh, presence as well. And uh, you also in that uh, video, you said, oh, if you're so worried, why don't, why don't you all uh, have kids? I know that Mark's uh, uh, got a daughter. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure having children is on... Uh, your list uh, uh, as well, uh, but uh, you mentioned that uh, you reached out to, to Tommy to to chat uh, with him. I, it's, it's, I've never been able to get him on on my show as well. As I mentioned, I've had Mark on uh, the Uncuckables. Uh, I'm having you on now, he the, he became surrounded. It seems Tommy by too many gatekeepers. He wasn't seen as the the working class lad uh, anymore. He had this whole team. Uh, around him and we basically don't see much of Tommy making videos anymore. It's all filtered through TR News and Avi Yemeni's YouTube channel. I know that he sort of wants to take it easy now, Tommy, uh, with with that fresh uh, court case over uh, responding to that man who allegedly pinched his, his daughter's bum and obviously he's been in and out of jail and he's got his, his family as well. But there, there's obviously a lot of people feel that he's sort of be, he, he he he's not the the accessible working class person again. Yeah, I do think that he he genuinely got involved in this because he cared about his uh, city Luton and all the problems that they were having with Muslims in Luton. But yeah, like I say, when when I just kind of look at the work that he does nowadays, it, it doesn't really speak to me because I feel like he only addresses a small part of the problem and then he diverts the attention away from the real problems and I'm not even talking about necessarily the, the JQ and stuff you know if people don't want to talk about that whatever but demographics is a racial problem it's not just an Islamic problem and this is a the most serious issue that we face today and to call people who are speaking about it white supremacists and then to oversimplify things by saying <clears throat> excuse me by saying just go and have a load of kids it's just such a stupid terrible argument because why should we get into a breeding competition in our own country? And we'd or, we'd be competing with people who already high, have extremely high fertility rates. So if we increased ours to say four children per woman, and then you have, I don't know, Somalis who have six children per woman, our population would just absolutely explode. We're only a tiny island. We'd ruin our countryside. We'd have no houses. We'd, we'd have no school places or anything. Why would we do that? Why would you think that that is a solution? 
the problem isn't i always say this it's becoming my catchphrase but the problem isn't that there that there are too few of us the problem is that there are too many of them so what we need to do is look at repatriation that's that's our solution at patriotic alternative and also closing the borders entirely so just to say just have kids it that doesn't solve anything all these people are still here all the problems that come with them the knife crime in london the terror attacks the honor killings the grooming gangs the the, the african caribbean politicians in parliament who are demanding reparations they're all still here so just saying having just have kids it, it doesn't fix anything it's just it's such a myopic oversimplified argument I understand in the early uh, 2010s why uh, Tommy made that effort to, to distance himself from the, uh, the ethno-nationalists at the time because the, the British National Party had spectacularly uh, uh, blown up and it seemed at that time that liberalism uh, was, was on the march. But obviously in the past uh, five years uh, since we've seen the, the, the left and and their uh, racial politics really come to uh, fruition to to still uh, go out of your way to attack people such as Mark and and other different uh, British nationalists that that's basically now punching right and you're on the defensive and you being being on the on the defensive when you should be attacking the the, the far left given that what they're enabling in in your country that that is not a good that's not a good uh, strategy to get into this right on right attack yeah definitely um and you know i have a lot of loyalty to mark because i have faith in him as a political leader and i also have faith in him as a person he's one of my best friends and he's just such a great guy he works tirelessly he's been involved with this with this for two decades now and the amount of hours that he puts in for free i mean I, I happen to know that he spends hours every single day just responding to people's problems and answering their emails and helping them out and he does that for free and has he always been perfect no has he always said the perfect thing no will he probably mess up again and say something stupid in the future yeah but we all do that we're all humans my optics aren't entirely perfect either there are going to be things i said on facebook seven years ago or something that i said in a defend europe live stream two years ago that aren't entirely perfect optics but if you want somebody who's got the experience that mark has and that is necessary to lead something like this then they're not going to have perfect optics they're a good, they, they, ha, they are going to have said things which are a little bit too edgy for the public. So all we can do is learn from it and try and be better in the future. And that's something that Mark has to do. And that's something that I have to do. But he's he's such a great guy. He really is. And like I said, I have a lot of faith in him and um, I stand by him entirely. I'm entirely loyal to him and patriotic alternative. I mean, that doesn't mean that we agree on everything because there are a couple of things that we do disagree on, just like, you know, everybody disagrees on little bits here and there but i think he's the man for the job yeah i think he's just an absolutely fantastic guy oh yeah as i said uh, when i reached out to him to, to have him on the the uncuckables at the the end of of last year even though uh, our show channel doesn't doesn't have uh, a thousand hasn't reached a thousand subscriber benchmark yet uh, he still said uh, yes was willing to to, uh, to talk with us and uh, talk about uh, patriotic alternatives so i certainly uh, appreciated that uh, let's uh, move on to what, what obviously is uh, your uh, most prominent uh, concern now and should be of concern to, to most uh, people in Britain is the continued uh, mass migration into uh, Britain, which began uh, after the, the Second World War, uh, around about the same time the British Empire uh, collapsed. And the, the title of your mini uh, documentary, which goes for 37 minutes, is We Were uh, Never Asked. And another way to phrase that is who decided, because this has, it's happened slowly uh, over o over the the second half of the the twentieth century, beginning with the the Afro uh, Caribbeans and the the Indians and the Pakistanis. Another thing that annoys me, I'm just going to go on a tangent here, is how the the British media describe these groom gangs as Asian, which they're referring to Pakistani. In Australia, Asian means Vietnamese Chinese. We refer to basically Indian and Pakistanis as well Indians. So, uh, 
but going back to uh, my point here that it's it's easy in the early days to introduce this uh, this new diversity because oh this is all new we get this uh, new food and that that that's become a a meme and as you said when you're in a small traditional British village you don't really th see the negative aspects of it until it's ratcheted it up which it is being now. Yeah, the the Asian thing is a strange one because Asians are still foreigners, so I'm not really sure what they're trying to do there. I guess they're trying to complicate. I mean, when I think Asian, I think Chinese. And when I think gr the grooming gangs, I think Muslim or Pakistani or Bangladeshi. So it's weird how they do that. But I've I've always remembered them doing that. I remember reading newspapers when I was a little kid and it said Asian on the front. So, yeah, I'm not really sure what that's all about, but... Did you want me to, to talk about We Were Never Asked? Is that yeah. in the immigration from 1948 onwards? Yes. So, uh, yeah. The, 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 because, yeah, it's not, it's not just the, the, the current uh, mob who uh, are doing it without the, the people's consent. It goes all the way back to the end of uh, World War II. Yeah, so it, mass immigration to Britain began in 1948 with Empire Windrush, which was a ship that was owned by the New Zealand Shipping Company. And uh, they basically realised that they could make a profit from advertising in the African Caribbean uh, for Jamaicans to come over to Britain. So they did that. They worked with the Minister of Transport, who was uh, the Minister of Transport under a Labour government in the United Kingdom. And they were making a profit from shipping immigrants over to Britain. Now, Clement Attlee, who was the Prime Minister at the time, and George Isaacs, who was in charge of Labour, Labour as in the workforce, not the Labour Party, they didn't know anything about this. Uh, so there's this myth that's been told in subsequent years that says, we invited these people to rebuild our country after the war and to fill a Labour shortage. It's just a complete lie. Like the the Labour minister didn't <laughs> didn't even know that they were they were coming over, and if you look at the old uh, newspaper articles from the time, uh, George Isaacs and Clement Attlee are saying we don't know who's invited these people over, but we will get to the bottom of it. We will treat them properly, but we don't know if we can find them work. So this lie about them, oh, we needed them to rebuild the country after the war. It's just rubbish. But mass immigration started in 1948, and it went at a steady pace. Uh, until probably, I mean, over the like the late 40s, 50s, 60s, it was running at maybe around 10,000 people per year. And then obviously when Tony Blair became prime minister in 1997, uh, it was just amplified and mass immigration started running at the hundreds of thousands per year. Uh, so in 2011, we were around 82% white British, 87% white. And that figure is currently dropping by around by around five to ten percent per decade, depending on the the country within the United Kingdom and the city that you look at. But yeah, it's just it, so it started in 1948, but then it increased from 1997 onwards. And there have been politicians who have stood up and said, "We don't want this. Enough is enough." Such as Sir Oswald Mosley and Enoch Powell, and they've had huge support from the public, but they've just been you know shunned by the media they've been fired they've been ostracized and ridiculed and the public have never wanted this that's why we said we were never asked when we made our documentary because you've never asked us if we want to become a minority in our own country but it's happening and it's such a huge issue to just think that you have control over without asking the public if we want to lose our home you know something that's been going for hundreds and hundreds of years just to throw it away. Uh, they never asked our permission to do it. So we went out and we surveyed the public on how they feel about us becoming a minority in Britain. Because um, if you read the media, you would think that everybody loves, loves this. You know, diversity is our strength. Think of the incredible range of restaurants that do the jobs that British people wouldn't do, all of that stuff. But we went out and we surveyed the public and uh, we didn't try to lead their answers we were just very kind of you know we're not getting involved in this just tell us the truth we, we don't care what you say we're not going to be offended and seven out of ten people said to us we do not want to become a minority in our country and only four percent of people said we think it's a good thing and then a quarter of people said that they had no strong feelings uh, obviously when you're looking at hard data all, all you can see is that they tick the box saying no hard feelings but on the day the people who went out and interviewed these people a lot of the people were too scared to answer the question and they were saying um 
oh, I can't answer that question. It's too racist. Or they were saying, oh, can you give me the answer? I'm not allowed to talk about this topic. So, yeah, a lot of people were scared to answer. So it was probably more than seven out of 10 people. But it was just such a white pill because we're constantly told that the majority of people agree with our demographic replacement and multiculturalism. But to actually get out and go out into communities and speak to people, the public are against it, overwhelmingly against it. So we can work with that because there's not a, a single politician in the House of Commons today who is speaking about this and who wants to stop that. So there's this huge percentage of the public who don't have anybody in Parliament representing them. So yeah, that's that's where we formed Patriotic Alternative. We want to stand up for these people and we want to stop this. Well, Enoch Powell, he had he, he made his uh, Rivers of, of Blood uh, speech uh, on uh, April 20th, uh, 1968. And he had his, even though he's been proven right, he had his political uh, career uh, destroyed. And in the era of the career uh, politician, uh, they, they don't want to, to, uh, to risk that. Yeah, it, I mean, this is what they do though, isn't it? They take somebody who's telling the truth whether that be Enoch Powell, whether it be... I mean, Tommy Robinson is telling the truth about some stuff and they take these people and they put them on a platform and then they abuse them, they attack their family, they go after their funding, they ridicule them, they make this um, evil kind of caricature out of them and then the public watch and think, oh my God, I'm not going to say what they're saying because you'll attack me, you'll attack my family, I'll lose my job, I'll get kicked out of university, I'll be attacked in the streets. And that's their tactic, that's what they do, because they're trying to make people scared of speaking out. Um, but we're not going to do it. I mean, me personally, my family and my friends and my fiancé don't care because they all have the same views as me. I'm self-employed, so you can't get me fired from my job and I've already graduated from university, so I'm not going to get kicked out of university, so... I think people like me are people who have to put themselves forward and say, I have nothing to lose, so I'm going to do this. Uh, and Max, somebody as well who puts himself at risk. And there are lots of people out there who are, who are doing it. We've had enough. The worst that you can do is throw us in jail. But for every time you throw us in jail, there'll be another 10 people who stand up and say, well, I'm not putting up with that. I'm going to start saying something now. So they can't throw all of us in jail. We just need to we just need to resist and we need to fire their tactics back at them and say, look what the media are doing. The media are lying. Who's doing this? Why are they doing it? Yeah, I just think that if enough of us stand up, then we have the numbers. So hopefully, I, I, th I do think it's going to be tough. I do think that we are going to be attacked. I mean, I went to Copenhagen. Uh, what month was it? December, I think. I went to the Scanza Forum uh, in Copenhagen and Antifa turned up. And we were, we were attacked by Antifa over there, but what can you do? Just refuse to go out of the house. It's just, it's a serious situation that we're in. We can't just stay quiet and not do anything. With you, with the, when you gathered the uh, statistics uh, for the, the d documentary, uh, and this is before I viewed the documentary. This is what I originally thought that the the documentary featured like vox pops, and you you shoved the camera and microphone in front of people. You didn't do that. It was just volunteers doing a an anonymous uh, survey, and then you you narrated the documentary and uh, su uh, summarized all of the the data uh, that you 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 gathered. And you're right that uh, to to get. Uh, those answers from people you, you obviously uh, obviously have to uh, get it from them uh, anonymously and uh, thank god that uh, we are in a, a democratic society which still has the the secret uh, ballot because well it, it's a common f it's not even known in australia the the shy tory factor how the polling on the 2015 general election showed that labor would win but the uh, conservatives won and then of course uh, uh, Brexit in in 2016, the the referendum there, that was the big one where everyone thought that Remain would win, and there was everyone was shocked that. Well, I, and when I say everyone, the the media uh, were they made it out that everyone was shocked that uh, uh, that Brexit uh, got up, and even though Nigel Farage, who was the leader of UKIP and founder of the Brexit Party, talked about a whole range of defects of being in the uh, the European Union, such as the bloated bureaucracy, the ridiculous uh, uh, regulations that were foisted upon the nation. It, it was, at the, the end of the day, a, 
a referendum on immigration and the the Schengen area, as it's called, the the free free flow of people throughout the the European Union states. Yeah, of course, it was about immigration. It was about immigration, and I also think it was kind of a um, maybe an attack on the ruling class who won't listen to us. I think people had had enough, and they were like, "Yes, yeah, screw this. We don't want this anymore." We're voting ourselves out of it. Uh, and to say that 52% of people voted leave when the entire media were just like, remain, remain, remain. And the government even paid for a leaflet to be delivered to every single house telling us why we should vote for remain. And 52% of people said no. And that's in a country where today we're probably around 75% white British. So yeah, I just that that was a, a, a big white pill. Um, but it, it wasn't a surprise to people like me who have looked at the opinion polls from Empire Windrush to the present day. And we know that the public have always overwhelmingly been against mass immigration. I mean, they might say immigration has some benefits, which I mean, it, it probably does. It probably does have a few small benefits, but the negatives completely outweigh the positives. And the public have said this again and again and again. So it's like the, the media and the people in charge surround themselves with people who agree with them. And then when the public disagree with them, they seem shocked by it. But for us, it's, it's not a, a shock at all. Do, do you mind if I ask you a, a quick question? Yeah, sure. What do you think of Fraser Anning? Uh, Fraser Anning, uh, he uh, to to give a bit of background, he was he he was uh, elected on a on a count back as a as a one uh, nation uh, senator. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much you know about uh, the leader of One Nation, uh, Pauline Hanson. She she is uh, these days she's a civic. Uh, nationalist uh, uh, so uh, she says that uh, um, she she want, well, it's, it's hard to explain hard to hard to explain but uh, uh, she does not want to be seen as well, one nation doesn't want to be seen as just a discriminatory party now and Fraser Anning he uh, when he was elected on count back he quit the party on the on the first day because uh, he had a falling out with with Pauline Hansen um, he was more explicit in wanting Australia to return to what it had uh, traditionally uh, been, which, uh, were, which was a predominantly uh, European uh, Australia. And uh, for, uh, for example, uh, this is an example of how towards civic nationalism, One Nation Australia in the New South Wales state election, just before our federal election, they chose a, a, a Muslim woman to, to be uh, a candidate, and they started attacking uh, Fraser Anning as a a racist and 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 bigot. He 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 was because Pauline was basically she she'd become because her her maiden speech in in 1996 talked about Australia being swamped by Asians, which it was being and it still uh, is being at the at the moment. But uh, she she wanted to maintain sort of respectability within the, the new paradigm, sort of how the US conservatives, how they've, they've evolved over the years. They, they used to fight against, for example, same-sex marriage. Now they just don't, don't care about it. That's, that's sort of where Pauline Hanson has sort of been. She's sort of adjusted to what is, she doesn't want to push back two months while Fraser Renning was prepared to uh, go uh, 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 speak frankly and also did not disavow the uh, the, the the grassroots uh, patriot activists as well so he he he, he just did not uh, uh, he wasn't out to sort of you know, get on the, the the mainstream media and the panel show he was just there to speak speak on what he thought was uh, the important issues and what Australia should be and what it was founded as that's yeah, probably, I, I, it's quite a long I, answer. I, yeah, I liked Fraser, Fraser Rowling when he was active. And um, I follow him on Twitter and he was tweeting about usury and stuff um, and also about demographics. And I was like, wow, I wish we had somebody like this in in uh, England. And I also loved how every time he said something that the media got upset by, they asked him to apologise. And he always just said, no, I don't apologise. I don't do that. And I was like, yes, Fraser, no apologies. It just seems a lot stronger than anybody we've got in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, but actually, I went to Australia last year and um, 
I went to Sydney and it's absolutely full of Chinese people in the centre. They've got their own Chinatown and that, haven't they? Um, and people, we get the argument over here, well, Chinese immigrants are uh, high IQ, they keep themselves to themselves, they don't really cause any trouble. But being in Sydney really made me realise that it doesn't really matter how high quality of immigrant they are, they're just not you. And there was no connection between us and them. It's like they don't give you eye contact. There's no community feel there. It's like you're both kind of another species or something. There was just nothing. They speak their own language. They just do their own thing. And the person that I was with, um, he, he saw that somebody dropped his wallet on the floor. So he, he picked up the wallet and he went and gave it to the Chinese guy. And the Chinese guy just didn't even give him eye contact, took it out of his hand and walked off. And I was just like, what, is this a, a disconnection thing or something? Because if that was a British person, they'd have been like, oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I just think that the problems with the Chinese really became apparent to me when I visited Sydney because there's, there's no connection there at all. It's like you're two completely separate communities, not talking to each other, not connecting with each other. And I know that they buy up all the businesses over there, don't they? And then they have like certain kind of shops where um, the, the writing's in Chinese so that you yes. can't even understand it. Uh, it's not it. just Chinatown in the, the Sydney and Melbourne CBD. There's In Sydney in particular, there's whole Chinese suburbs such as uh, Chatswood uh, in the, the inner uh, northwest and, and Bankstown further uh, southwest where you, you, you go there and it just looks like you're you're not even in sort of a, a high class uh, Asia, a, a, like Asian city. It looks like you're sort of in in sort of to 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 be a bit crass. You're sort of in one of those wet market uh, areas. There, I'm from Melbourne, and our main Chinese area is uh, Box Hill. That's that's a bit more of a sophisticated Chinese suburb. It's it looks. It looks more like Hong Kong, with sort of the it has all the the the, the, the sort of like the, the the Chinese New York to uh, to put it there. It looks it looks uh, it's much more uh, uh, jazzy, uh, but it's it's certainly you don't think that you're you're in Australia. And uh, given with the the coronavirus pandemic that it was uh, born in Wuhan, China, it did come from bats, uh, either from the bat soup or the that bioweapons lab we are in the the asia pacific area and so we have lots of our universities have international students from china we've had constant there, there's constant uh people movement from uh, australia and china uh, they haven't just uh, bought up uh, a lot of uh businesses but also a lot of our farmlands as well there we have these things called dago shoppers where they they started with baby formula mass buying that and sending it back to, to china but during the the panic buying we've had here they've sent uh, a lot of uh supplies back to china and they're even uh, uh, uh front uh front companies for the for the chinese uh state were mass purchasing uh hand sanitizer and other medical supplies and shipping them back uh, uh to china yeah, one, I'm not sure if it's the same in Australia, but one problem that we have here is the education system and how you charge a student to go to university, but if it's a foreign student, they pay, I think it's around three times as much. So the universities like to prioritise foreign students because they get more money for them. Yeah, the same And here. we have a big problem <clears throat> with the Chinese and also um, the higher caste Indians as well. The, the universities tend to prioritise them because they, they make more of a profit from it. And then we have this another myth that's going around in Britain about we need all these foreigners to help us with the NHS and it's like well the reason why a lot of our doctors are foreign is because the universities are prioritizing them over British students you know we have British students who have got all the qualifications who have worked hard but you're not accepting them in university to be a doctor because they're not paying as much and we shouldn't be doing that that needs to be absolutely nipped in the bud because how we we can't prop up our own society ourselves if we're prioritizing foreign students over our own people. So it's all right saying we need them. Well, we only, we only need them because they're the people that you're training up. Stop doing that, and we don't need them anymore. Is that the same in Australia? It it, it is the same with within terms of yeah they get they they get because they're full fee paying the international students uh, at the 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 university is it's a cash cow. Uh, for them and it, 
as I've heard Mark talk about your your NHS, how a lot of uh, a lot of them are uh, non British uh, eth ethnicity, and it's the same also with our, a lot of our GP clinics and and hospitals, a lot of uh, non white doctors and that, and yeah, we're told to to praise these as as great uh, immigrants, so they're, they're doing the high school jobs, but. 50 years ago, we both Britain and Australia did just fine with just local doctors. Yeah, well, over here, they tend to do the either the doctor positions. And like I say, it's because they've been through our university system or they tend to do the low skilled jobs, which is like the hospital cleaners and stuff, which um, both positions we should be able to offer to our own people. We should be training up our own doctors. And then the low skilled positions, we should be incentivizing people to want to do them rather than, you know, offering a measly wage that's not a living wage for most people. And uh, we should be standing on our own two feet. I really hate the idea of, oh, we can't do this. Let's fall to the floor and cry and ship in a load of foreigners. We're Great Britain, for God's sake. We should be standing on our own two feet and running our own economy and our own sectors. So I really hate that argument, but over here they are actually, I think they're 26% of the NHS, but they're something like 80% of tribunal cases. So we have a lot of problem with foreign doctors anyway. And then of course there's the language barrier where sometimes you'll go into a hospital A&E for a checkup and you just can't understand what they're saying. And my granddad actually fell down some steps outside the post office a couple of years ago and broke his hip. And the people who were looking after him, after him, don't get me wrong, some of them were lovely, but some of them just could hardly speak English. And he was very upset, you know, his hip was broken. He ended up staying in hospital for a few months. And just to not have that connection with the person who's caring for you, it's just terrible. I, I remember uh, quite vividly, it was, it, it was broadcast on, onto our news as another moment. Uh, Prince Philip has, had put his uh, uh, foot in it when he was visiting a, 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 a hospital somewhere uh, in England. And he asked uh, one of the nurses, oh, uh, oh where, where are you from? And she said, the Philippines. And he was like, yes, we've seen quite, <laughs> I've seen quite a few of uh, you from uh, uh, that land in our hospitals. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm just reading the um, the chat as well, and somebody said, why should we steal the doctors from around the world? And that's another thing, isn't it? Like, we're taking doctors from all these countries, and then we're shipping them aid, international aid, because they can't run their own civilizations. Why are we taking their best people? I mean, it's not fair for us, and it's not fair for them. We might take a few questions on entropy. I'll save a few for, for later when we, we get on to those uh, topics. Uh, uh, just saying has asked uh, how would Laura best approach counter jihadists who refuse to acknowledge the obvious Jewish role in open borders uh, throughout the world? Uh, what's uh, or, what's your opinion first on the, the preface of that question? Well, I think it's accurate in saying that these people are overrepresented in sectors such as uh, the media, academia, banking, NGOs, charities, all these left-wing think tanks, etc, etc. That's just a fact. I mean, if anyone wants to break it down by numbers, in Britain, they're not 0.5% of the electorate. So if they're over not 0.5% in the media, then that's over-representation. And these are the people who demand diversity quotas so that everything is, is equal. But then when it comes to this group, the diversity quotas apparently don't matter. But I, I think it's a difficult topic. And Mark describes it as the final boss. You can't just pick somebody up off the street and then be like, hey guys, JQ, because they can't absorb it. It's a slow process and you need to take baby steps, I think. It's like building a wall. It's like the railings on the top of the wall. You can't put them up until you've got all the bricks underneath. So I would start by talking to people about problems that they're experiencing where they live, such as, um, I mean, one, pro one problem that I experienced was my mum got fired from her job and they recruited a Polish man in her position and paid him less than they were paying my mum. So that's something that you can talk to people about. It's not something that, that impacts 66 million people in the country, but it links to that individual and it's something that they've suffered because of immigration. So just try and find things which relate to them. It might be to do with you know their child being the only English kid in their classroom and there being interpreters in the classroom which are holding the other kids back. There are lots of things that you can talk about. And then I think the inquisitive people and the intelligent people will want to know why is this happening? Why are our government allowing this to happen? Is it by accident or is it on purpose? And then at that stage, you can point them to further information and say, well, look at this or look at that. But it, it's a slow process and not everybody gets there. 
Uh, for me, for a long time, I felt like I, I felt like I understood 99% of it, but I couldn't take that final step. And I was like, I just, I don't understand. I don't quite get it. And then one day I just saw one too many coincidences and I was like, right, I get it now. That's it. <laughs> I'm completely red filled. So it's just a slow process. Let, let people get there in their own time. Don't force topics, which are, are very controversial because I, I think you'll just scare people away. Uh, my uh, point of view on on this this topic is that uh, everything should be open up for discussion. I might not uh, agree with it, but this is why I do these shows. I want to explore all the topics. Nothing. Obviously, I still have to abide by YouTube's uh, uh, community standards, but this is why I'm in the alternative media because I want to have those uh, curly uh, conversations and. Uh, discuss things frankly and because there's there's so much that uh, we're, uh, we're we're told by the the mainstream media and uh, uh, in uh, by the historians where if you, you scratch a bit deeper you find that there's more to uh, history and lots of other things that uh, you haven't been told at all Yeah, absolutely. And and the truth matters. The truth does matter. And the reason why I'm involved in this is because I genuinely care about Britain and I want to fix all the problems. And in order to be able to fix all these problems, we have to be honest about the threats that we're facing, because how can we how can we fix something if we don't even talk about it? But then again, I also think that you have to hold back sometimes and try and think a little bit tactically and when you learn things yourself you just want to be completely honest and you want to like sing from the top of the roofs and be like everyone look what's happened but sometimes you do have to kind of hold yourself back and think is this the best approach and I think that's something that I'm still learning you know there is stuff that I said publicly last year that I probably wouldn't say publicly this year just because I don't think it's the best tactic it's true what I said but I, I just think you have to be a little bit careful you have to be a little maybe even a little bit deceitful because the media are so we have to play them at their own game but um yeah like i said the the reason why i'm involved in this is because i care and you have the prime minister who's there but then it, really he's just kind of the puppet or the monkey and then behind you have the puppet master or the organ grinder and it's the media and it's the think tanks and it's the central banks and if we are to fix britain then we do need to go after those as well but like i say i think it's a slow process and with patriotic alternative we're starting by building communities uh, and forming our own networks in real life and then when we do go down the political route it will be local elections you know going out and picking up litter and helping people in their local communities and, and really building a, a real safe british community that's what we want to do we're not expecting to be prime minister at the next election and save britain and you know that's it we need to take baby steps and we are fighting this huge powerful dishonest enemy so yeah that's it really i hope that answers the question <laughs> uh, james boom has asked what motivates successive uk governments to continue their policy of population replacement democide is it uh, the money, and I guess that follows on from what you just said, uh, 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 Boris Johnson. Uh, I know that those uh, Antifa after he got uh, re-elected were yelling racist, uh, fascist. But if you have a look at the uh, the, the senior uh, ministers around him, Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, and the the Home Secretary uh, Priti uh, Patel, uh, both uh, non non and non white uh, senior members of the the cabinet there and the uh, the previous chancellor of the uh, exchequer was uh, sivat uh, jivad i think i pronounced that uh, right so you can see he's he's already surrounded by that uh, diversity uh, but obviously yeah. it happened a lot before then as well yeah, sad dude, Javid it is. But um, yeah, I mean, I think people sometimes over oversimplify it and say it's just this one group and they harbour a lot of hatred and resentment towards us and, and they're pulling the strings. And to a certain extent, that's true. Those people are pulling the strings and they have a lot of resentment towards us. I think they feel more comfortable amongst multiculturalism as well. Uh, Barbara Roche, who was the Minister of Immigration under Tony Blair, openly said that she loved the diversity of London because as a Jewish woman it just made her feel comfortable so there is that issue but then I also think there's politicians who are more interested in being a member of polite society and they're more interested in their own bank balance 
Uh, there are businesses who want to drive down wages, things like that. There are businesses who want to increase consumerism and they want to have this generation of sort of like average IQ worker bees who can operate machinery but don't really think for themselves and they buy all these gadgets and then you have politicians who just think in five-year election cycles and they're more interested in you know being another uh prime minister or being another secretary of state within the next five years and they bow down to all these people and listen to their demands and as somebody who's just got involved in politics i mean we're not even a real political party yet but i'm the deputy leader of pa you do get a lot of pressure from people saying, don't talk about this, do talk about this. And, and you just have to think, what is the end goal here? And what do I stand for? And I'm not going to waver on that. And that's what Mark and I are trying to do. But I think these people do get a lot of pressure. You know, they'll say, oh, we'll give you this bonus or we'll publish this article for you or you'll get the support from this charity and, and things like that. And they just end up bowing down to it. And I think a lot of people do get involved for the right reasons, but then they end up, just changing their mind and changing their priority. Maybe they get used to a certain amount of uh, publicity or a certain salary and then they become comfortable at that level and then it needs to continue. I don't know, but I think it's a complicated issue and I think there are lots of reasons why this is happening. And some of it is our people and some of it is foreign groups. Uh, Port Film Cooper has asked, Laura, what are your feelings towards libertarianism and how it may relate or not to the subjects you've discussed about Britain? Uh, UK doesn't really have a, a libertarian party. Nigel Farage said he was he and UKIP were somewhat uh, libertarian. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a libertarian and it's never really been something that I've been attracted to. I do think it's something that you hear the Americans talking about more than we do in Britain. But um, for me, I, I I don't I don't think that should be the basis of what you stand for. You know, liberty and freedom. I think my priority is long term happiness. So uh, a safe nation where people feel like they have an identity, and where um, there are a level of rules and regulations in place, but not sort of like you know authoritarian, totalitarian, Stalinist government, nothing like that. But I think that there needs to be some sort of collectivism and some sort of regulations from the government to make sure that things are okay. Like businesses, for example, or, or let's take the media as an example. I don't think that the media should have complete free speech because they lie constantly and they lie for their own personal gain, whether that be cultural or financial. And I think there, sh there should be so some sort of sanctions on the media so that if they tell this huge lie and millions of people see it, they should face the consequences of that. So yeah, I'm not a libertarian. And like I said, it's never really been something that I've been attracted to. And this is actually something that my followers disagree with me on. And I sometimes get told off when I'm not, when I'm like, I'm not all about liberty and freedom, but I, I just feel like it's maybe a bit of an, an infantile way of looking at things. I do think we need rules. Um, yeah, and I do think that we need to think about the greater happiness and safety of society rather than it all being about the individual and, you know, just running around being atomized and doing whatever you want. Uh, we've got a, another question from Senator Slayer. Uh, I think this is a hypothetical he's asking. Laura, I'm Jewish and a big supporter of Israel. How do I join Patriotic Alternative? We must never forget the six trillion. Uh, well, you can join Patriotic Alternative by going to Israel and uh, just supporting us by being a, a nationalist in your own country, I guess. <laughs> now, we've talked about the, the government and their uh, enabling of uh, mass migration. You, we've, we've talked about the, the media uh, briefly, but pretty much the, well, it's the, the, the BBC, it has a worldwide reach. Uh, uh, but in the in the UK, it owns uh, operates two of the the, the five uh, free to air uh, networks, and it is like our ABC in Australia preaches a far left uh, uh, viewpoints, and it itself has uh, diversity uh, quotas. But your commercial media, such as uh, Sky News, and then of course the the, the tabloid uh, newspapers, they're accused of, of planning uh, racial division from time to time, but they're more interested in who's sleeping with who, who and the, the, the girls with tits on page three. Yeah, the media is terrible. And I often say that it's the, the biggest enemy that we face. Um, 
yeah I, I mean I'm not really sure what to add to what you've just said but it's just it's atrocious I mean we have the BBC I remember when I was a child watching the BBC and enjoying the old comedy shows that they used to have on um and like nature shows and stuff and some of it is good but then the the constant anti-white propaganda that you see from the BBC I'll give you an example on the weekend that the Telford grooming gang, and again, I'm going to get told off for saying grooming gang, but YouTube friendly language, the grooming gang scandal broke in the United Kingdom. I can't remember how many girls it was in Telford because we've had that many grooming gangs. Uh, the scandal broke and the BBC didn't publish a single article about it, but they published three articles about a black girl who had received racial abuse in a university. So they called her the N word, I think, or shouted something at her. Three articles about that, not a single article about hundreds of girls being raped and abused in Telford and that's what the media are like they pick and choose their stories and you can always tell if the perpetrator of a, a crime is foreign they just won't give a description of him or her at all but if it's a, a white person it will be you know white this or white that uh, they use words like British when they're talking about Syrian terrorists, British terrorists abroad. It's just the language that they use is so manipulative. Homegrown and... terrorism is the, uh, the foreign yeah. fighters. Or they'll say like olive coloured, olive coloured skin person. And it's like, what? <laughs> so, yeah, w one thing that we need to do is break through this. Um, <laughs> somebody just said in the chat, please come in for you, Laura. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's what I was thinking rest. as well. They beat me to the joke. <laughs> They've probably come to arrest somebody for buying the wrong thing at the shop or something. But um, yeah, the the uh, the media is just terrible. And one recent example of it was St. George's Day and how um, or St. George's Day was on the 23rd, so four days ago, and how the media just, oh, it was just, St. George's Day is a reminder why multiculturalism is great because St. George was foreign and all that stuff. And I just think, oh, shut up. And the brainwashing that our people demonstrate on days like St George's Day when they're just like um, oh you know I, I'm not proud to be British and all this self-hating stuff it's so evident how deep the indoctrination from the media runs in our own people and I think that has to be one of our tasks that we're willing to undertake we need to break through that brainwashing it happens because of the media and it happens because of uh, academia in the education system from when you're four years old and you go to nursery up to PhD level. And these are two things that we need to address. It can't just be immigration, immigration, immigration all the time. We need to talk about the media and we need to talk about the education system. Uh, probably the most uh, outspoken uh, nationalist commentator who was in the, the, the mainstream media in the UK was Katie Hopkins. She had her, uh, the, the mainstream media blacklisted her after her uh, tweet after the, the Manchester uh, arena uh, bombing, which you actually didn't mention was little girls being blown to bits after this Ariana Grande uh, concert. Uh, Katie Hopkins uh, tweeted about uh, uh, mass migration in Islam, we need a final solution. And because she mentioned the term final uh, solution, uh, that was enough for her to get fired by, by LBC, the, uh, the radio uh, station. She deleted that tweet and replaced it with lasting solution, which is, it, it, this is another ridiculous thing. If you, if you say a, uh, the wrong, uh, uh, say something the wrong way, uh, then that's enough to, to, to ruin a, a, a career. They, this is why the, the media went so hard against Fraser Rainey from the, the beginning, because he, he proposed a plebiscite on, on immigration to Australia, given that we were allowed a plebiscite on, on same-sex marriage. And uh, the, the politicians got their, uh, well, and the media got the answer that they liked. So it was legislated in two weeks, not three years like uh, Brexit. But because he said final solution, uh, uh, that was uh, that was it. The, the, the media were out for him. I kind of felt like there was a bit of a difference between how Fraser Anning said it and how Katie Hop Hopkins said it, because for her to say that we need a final solution, that was pretty daft. But with Fraser Anning, if I'm correct, wasn't he just listing things and he went and the third solution and the fourth solution and the final solution? It was when he was, it was during his maiden speech. So it was a prepared speech. He was talking about the, the problem of immigration. And so we need a public vote as a final solution. Yeah, I, I, I don't think he did it intentionally. Maybe I'm wrong. 
But I do think that she did it intentionally. And she's intelligent. I'm not the biggest fan of her, but she knows what she's doing. So I think she did say it for that reason. But she shouldn't lose a job for saying it. She got sacked from the, the Mail Online, I think it was, that she wrote for. It was actually a, a group of uh, Jewish people who lobbied to have her fired from from that but she still loves them but um yeah katie hopkins is another one i actually met her at a, a conference she gave a speech at a conference a couple of years ago and she's really nice you know she's really humble but she's another one who i mean she was advertising the israeli army not too long ago on twitter and encouraging people to go and join the israeli army uh, and she stands there with a t-shirt saying i love israel in israel and i just think what are you doing you're supposed to be british why do you why do you even care and we know why she cares don't we <laughs> Oh, she's begun peering in in our mainstream media on our version of, of Sky News, which is more like Fox News, not the Sky News you have in the uh, the UK on the uh, Outsiders program, which is sort of the, the most edgelord uh, program on Australian uh, mainstream uh, media. And she is a, an excellent troll, I'll, I'll give her that. She Like, for example, she said... Uh, it wasn't on uh, on Outsiders, but on our Today Show, that uh, if you go and look up uh, Tramp in the dictionary, you'll see a picture of Meghan Markle. Yeah, she hates Meghan Markle. And to be honest, I don't like Meghan Markle either. Um, she just comes... She's Our royal family is obviously something which is very historic and means a lot to a lot of people. And they're completely cooked now. Honestly, they are completely cooked. But Meghan Markle's arrived in the royal family and um, just tried to shake it up. She's just, she's a feminist. She's a pro open borders. The issues that she chooses to care about are things like Grenfell Tower and, you know, anything to do with black people, basically. So we, we don't want that in the royal family. We want somebody who respects its traditions and respects its, its honour. And um, Kate did it very well. But Meghan Markle, just an absolute nightmare. So I don't like her either. And I remember the interview that she did when her and Harry announced their engagement. And when Kate did the interview, she sat there kind of demure. When she was asked questions, she responded in a really elegant way. And, and uh, Meghan Markle was just talking over Harry. And she was like a, a complete motor mouth. And Harry was just sat there in silence, not being able to get a word in. So I don't like her either. But uh, Katie Hopkins absolutely despises her. Yeah, she's she's definitely got an issue with her. Well, she's cucked probably the most Chad Prince there there's ever been. I mean, he he served in Afghanistan. Uh, Harry, uh, he, he was uh, uh, a, a party boy and and, did, and didn't mind getting uh, getting a bit uh, touchy feely with the, the ladies. And then of course there was the the Vegas uh, trip where his clothes fell off there and of course the the fancy dress party as well with the 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 nazi uniform and you just have a look at him him now it's clear that she owns him that he's just this demoralized depleted man which is if it can happen to him if he can be cucked then it can happen to any man which is sad yeah i would hope not i mean maybe he's just i don't know yeah, but you watch the videos, don't you? And she kind of like tells him where to sit and then she'll like cut in front of him and shake someone's hand and he just stands there at the back. And if I did that to my fiance, he'd be like, what are you doing? Stop being rude. Whereas he just seems to, he just seems to put up with it, doesn't he? And we've also seen Prince Charles and, and now Prince William uh, jump on the, the environmental climate change uh, bandwagon as well uh we, we saw prince charles uh, meet uh, uh, greta thunberg she's the the one white girl which you're not allowed to attack it seems uh but uh, they're, they're certainly becoming more proactive in the globalist uh, agenda rather than being guardians of of the united kingdom yeah and the queen said something about multiculturalism the other day and then she also said something about um, it was something to do with the coronavirus and the NHS and foreigners helping us or something. And they're supposed to be apolitical. And it's like, do you know how many, how, how much a percentage of the public are against all this immigration? So with you making these comments about multiculturalism and us all working together, you are being political because you're going against the wishes and, and the desires of the majority. So yeah, they're just a, a nightmare. I think Prince Philip's pretty based. He said a few best things in, in the past um but yeah i mean even he's i mean he's really old now anyway isn't he well let's see 90 98 he's, he's had a good innings as has the, the the queen uh herself and part of the reason why australia uh, we 
didn't become a republic and why the, the republic has been off off the political uh, agenda is because the the queen ha- has has basically been the the role model uh, monarch but the the next generation charles and william if they start to have this uh will not directly interfere but appear to shape uh politics people should watch uh the the, the British House of Cards uh, sequel to, to play the king to, to see what happens when there's a meddling uh, monarch. Uh, I think that's when uh, resentment in Australia, at least, against the royal family would start and people would want, uh, crave a republic more. Yeah, because you have the same, do you, you have the queen on your money and stuff as well, don't you? Yes, we right? do. Yeah, you have the same monarch. Um, it's just a shame because the the monarch used to be something which was incredibly powerful and it, and it had a purpose. And when you look back and look at the old kings and queens, it's something to be proud of. But then you look at it today and it's just, it's nothing. It's just weak and, and feeble. And you can tell that they're saying stuff that somebody else is telling them to say. And it, it's just a shame. It's just another example of something which is British, which has been destroyed or is on its way to being destroyed. And I'm not sure how we could... Uh, ever rectify that to be honest but i like the idea of a strong monarch it's just that the monarch that we have today is just yeah it's just terrible i see that uh, mark has arrived in the in the chat so the the, the chat has, has lit up again yeah somebody said the future prime minister is here <laughs> hopefully well they want you if... to be the, the the home secretary is what they've been saying I want to be the Minister of Repatriation. <laughs> That's my dream job. Now, we've talked about the, the media. Let's talk about the, the British uh, police because they, they, don't, uh, they, they haven't done a good job in uh, cracking down on these uh, grooming gangs. They and the media have, and the, the local uh, governments have colluded to, to keep it uh, covered up, haven't done much about the, the asset attacks, knife crime and constant terror attacks, it seems, but they are good at monitoring uh, social media and busting people's doors open for a, a mean comment or tweet or a transphobic uh, remark. Yeah, the the um, the perfect. I'm losing my voice. Sorry. The perfect um, you know example to give is just how little they cared about the victims of grooming and how they openly covered it up and refused to talk about things because of fear of being called racist. Uh, this is something which is widely known now. Go out and read any report or newspaper article about it. The police stayed quiet on it, and not only the police but social services and politicians and representatives, healthcare workers, everything. So it's just been a terrible, terrible situation that we've experienced and are still experiencing in the, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, but then when it comes to uh, arresting people for mean words, arresting people for hate crimes, we have this thing at the moment where um, we, we have this increase in hate crimes in Britain and they're saying, oh, there are more hate crimes every single year. And it's just like, well, that's because you're classifying somebody being, being misgendered as a hate crime. You know, if somebody says, oh, are you a bloke or a woman? It's classed as a hate crime and they're, they're acting like it's violent crime when it isn't. So they're, yeah, they're arresting people for all sorts of crimes, uh, nasty comments on social media, mean words. Uh, have you seen the videos of them dancing and uh, walking down the street in pride parades and stuff? It's just an embarrassment. They're just getting everything completely wrong, but they seem to have no self-awareness. It's like the public are, are saying, what are you doing? Is this the best way to spend public funds? And they don't stop. And then they'll they'll post videos of them filming people in the countryside during the coronavirus lockdown and saying, you touched that gate that somebody else had already touched. You, you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, it's mental. I, I do apologise if you can hear some building work outside my flat. They, they appear to be doing some roadworks. Hopefully it's not too loud. Oh, well, that is uh, productive work. I, I, I would say uh, repairing the roads. Uh... I'm glad they're still doing that. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is, unless it's a bin men or something. They usually come on a Thursday, but it, it sounds rather loud outside my window. So hopefully that's not coming through to everyone. Ah, uh, we can we we can deal with it. Uh, you talked you talked about at the beginning of the show. They are legitimately going through people's shopping to see if they're buying what I deem essentials. Because well, I. I I and others have been complaining about our uh, lockdown, that the police can pull you over uh, to, uh, to see if you're out of the house for a legitimate uh, uh, reason. And there have been uh, people who have been fined uh, inside their homes because they've had people who don't uh, reside uh, in their, their home 
over to play things as not innocuous as video games and had they find out probably that we've got a snitch line uh, as well but it hasn't got to that ridiculous level where they're where they're going through uh your shopping or or visiting uh, apartment complexes to to check that you're isolated uh in your unit yeah the police over here actually ended up apologizing because they were trying to arrest and uh what's the word convict or find people for not social distancing and being out and then they ended up apologizing saying that actually we don't have the right to do that so we've had people over here who have been arrested and fined for going shopping with people who they live with which you're allowed to do um they've had people who have been arrested and fined because they've been driving due to boredom all sorts of things <coughs> um and did you see the the story that was a about a week or two old of somebody who had put up some hundred hander stickers and it said uh pubs closed borders open That's yes what the we, 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 we saw that which yeah it's true uh, but it was yeah. a hate speech hate crime yeah so apparently they sent around nine police officers to arrest that person for putting up a sticker and it's like 19,000 English girls were abused last year and you've got the resources to do that it's just terrible and we can't just say that they're stupid because they're not stupid. This is coming from above. Somebody's telling them to do this. Why are they telling them to do it? And what's their end goal? And it's also easier to uh, police a, a more compliant uh, white uh, population as well, rather than, than, than tackle uh, violent migrant crime. That's the other thing. Yeah, we had problems with... Um, Terror, with the terrorism um, and the police were told that they weren't allowed to go into certain mosques in Birmingham to arrest people and you know to, to go and speak to the community and stuff so it is different real for them uh, compared to the different real for us they seem very confident in attacking white people like they're able to get away with that but when it's Muslims or when it's you know people of other ethnicities they won't do it at all and yeah it, it does feel like we have these uh, dual legal systems where if you're a white person you're not allowed to do anything but if you're a non-white person you can get away with everything it's unfortunate but it, it, it's something that we have to deal with because they are in power and obviously we don't want to go to prison but also we can't just put up with it because they're it feels like they're tightening it year, year on year every year it seems a little bit worse than than the last year and there needs to be a time when we say yeah we're not gonna we're not gonna refuse to say this are we gonna refuse to do that and I, I saw a Mark's uh, video uh, that he posted last last week, uh, or it might have been a few days ago actually, about how even though uh, the British citizens are in lockdown, they're still allowing all the the the, the migrants and temporary workers to to flow through the uh, the border, and it's no wonder that uh, the UK has had uh, twenty thousand coronavirus uh, deaths because in Australia, the, the secret ingredient or secret formula, how we've been able to uh, only have 80 coronavirus deaths is that we've shut our borders now to foreigners. If you're not an Australian citizen or resident, you, you can't come in. And one of our states, Western Australia, they've even shut their borders off to the, the Eastern states. So that is the, uh, 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 that is the secret to containing a foreign virus if you just shut down the borders. Yeah, I haven't watched Mark's video because I don't have the internet. So my, my data is, um, you know, just kind of using it for vital tasks at the moment. But Mark will know the statistics. Basically, the borders are still open and new people are coming into the country. One thing that I did say, see is that they were inviting Romanians over to do fruit picking jobs in the United Kingdom. And the media were saying, our oh, British people won't do the jobs. But then we did a little bit of digging. There's actually an article on the Patriotic Alternative website if anyone wants to check it out. And it turns out that 33,000 British people had applied to do those fruit picking jobs. And uh, they hadn't they hadn't given the jobs to any British people. And people were sharing their, um, their emails from the fruit picking organizations, which were saying, sorry, we don't have any spaces left. We've had an overwhelming response this year. Uh, but then the media were going with the story that British people are too lazy to do it, so we need the foreigners to come in and do it, when it's just, it's not true. They're shipping in the foreigners during a, a, a virus pandemic and then lying, saying that British people won't do these jobs when British people are out of work because of the virus and want to work. So it's just lie after lie after lie after lie. Uh, we've had our uh, uh, temporary migrant workers, they've actually left. We've had a population uh, retraction of around 200 to 300,000 because of the 
uh, coronavirus because well, it's our our populace and media and politicians are smart enough to uh, uh, to realize that well we we need to secure our food supply and the the worst worst thing is to worst thing to do is to import foreigners to, to, to pick the fruit who have been God knows where uh, come into contact with uh, whoever and make the, the virus spread potentially. Yeah, if the, if you ever needed a piece of evidence to prove that the government don't care about us, then, then this is it, coronavirus. Uh, they couldn't do anything for the grooming scandal or the demographic replacement, but then I think it was something like 15% of the economy, of the total economy, is the amount that they forked out for this. And they're still shipping in foreigners all the time. It's just, there, there are so many things that we can highlight to people to say, look what the government are doing, they do not care about you. And that, that's what we're trying to do at Patriotic Alternative. We actually have a, a news section on the website and we upload two to three articles a day. And it's all this kind of stuff that we talk about. So anyone who's listening, do feel free to check that out. Yeah, I've had a look at the, the, the new uh, Patriotic Alternative website. I'll just do a, a screen share uh, of it. Uh, so here it is. Here it's got, obviously, you've got a new section here, your manifesto, uh, get involved. And uh, there's your news section uh, there. And you've got a resource section. You're still allowed on, on mainstream uh, social media for the, uh, the moment. I assume that you're sort of uh, well, uh, pl uh, planning ahead with uh, keeping in mind that you could get kicked off at, at any moment. Yeah, so we, because it's a new website, it only launched a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, well, maybe a month ago now, uh, I, I run it um, and I run the, the Twitter account and the Facebook account, but obviously I, I do quite a lot as well, like I'm, overall I'm the deputy leader, um, I have my own YouTube channel, I do, I work at Defend Europe as an editor and a writer, so I think I might have to start <laughs> delegating some of the work, but it would be good to get some social media accounts on alternative platforms. It's just deciding which ones we want to do and then maybe trying to build up a following on there. We don't actually have our own YouTube account. We just have a YouTube schedule where we link to the personal accounts of people who uh, are endorsed by patriotic alternatives, such as myself, Mark, <coughs> uh, Millennial Wars, Way of the World, the Iconoclast, Morgoth, people like that. Uh, but we could start our own uh, video making uh, website as well. Maybe um, we could get something on Bitchu or on on YouTube, I don't know, but there's lots that we can do. We've, we've only just started and I get constant emails from people coming to me with ideas like, can I help out with this or can I help out with that? And it's like, yeah, we can do all this stuff. We just need to kind of come up with a schedule of when we're going to do it and put it into practice. But there's only me and Mark working at Patriotic Alternative at the moment and we both do it voluntary. And then we have thousands of people who have signed up to do activism or, you know, get involved with IRL activities, come to conferences, stuff like that. And at, at the moment, it, I think it's quite overwhelming for us to be able to manage everything and we could do with a, a couple of members of staff or something to respond to all the emails, but we will get there and there's lots of stuff that we're planning. I mean, one of the things that we're actually working on at the moment, we're about to, to launch it, is um, an alternative curriculum. We want a section on the PA News website, which is just full of resources that people can use if they choose to homeschool their children and we're working with two teachers on that so it's not just me and Mark thinking we know everything we're working with two ex-teachers who are totally red-pilled on everything and they want to um, give us resources whether that be videos documents um, you know teaching plans which are about the history of Britain and, and all other topics as well math science English but they're not cooked and they're not teaching our children to hate themselves. We want them to be honest and we want them to teach our children to be strong, critical thinkers. So that alternative curriculum is something that we're beginning to work on now. And obviously we won't have a full curriculum by the end of the week. It will take a long, long time to do that. And it's something that we will keep adding to over time. But we have all these projects in the work. And I'm also working with a, a gentleman on a, a document about the NHS. We want to pr provide either a document or an infographic, which will be an overview of the entire situation and then what we can do to fix the NHS. So to the people who say that we never come up with solutions, we do actually spend quite a lot of our time focusing on solutions. So there's lots going on in PA at the moment. It's just trying to manage it all, you know, with the time and and getting other people involved and delegating tasks. But we will get there. 
Uh, you and Mark have done very well on, on BitChute. Uh, just having a look at, at your own uh, channel here, you've got over 10,000 subscribers on BitChute, which is no, no easy feat to, to do on that, uh, on that platform. Uh, the, one of our uh, entropy questions is, uh, it's uh, preempted uh, what I was going to ask, what are patriotic alternatives goals for the next year or two, assuming COVID-19 clears up soon that is because obviously you wanted to have these regional meetings and that which can't take place at the moment yeah it's a shame because the lockdown came into effect just after the pa conference and there was such a hype after the conference a lot of people wanted to create their own regional groups so we already have regional groups in yorkshire the west midlands and london and we're in the process of setting some up in scotland wales and I believe there's another one as well. So we have people who want to be regional organisers for these areas. And then they have groups of, uh, I mean, I think in Yorkshire, we have maybe around 100 people that come to our Yorkshire events. Uh, they don't all go to every single event, but that's how many people we have. So we want to set up these local communities around the country so that people can do little tasks on their own, you know, rather than feeling like you have to wait for the two conferences that we have a year. We actually did a, an escape room in Yorkshire just before the conference, which was, have you been to any of those escape rooms where they put a bag over your head and then they handcuff you and they put you in a room and they're like, right, you have to escape and you have to find all the clues and stuff. That was like a team building activity. It was a fun night. So we want to focus on building these regional areas. We want to do another piece of activism this year, something like we were never asked, but for a different topic. Uh, and then we also have the autumn conference, which is uh, obviously in the autumn as well. That's what we're going to work on at the moment. Then we've got the alternative curriculum, the NHS document, fill in the website up with news articles. Um, hopefully we'll be accepted to be a, a real political party at some point this year when they finally pull their finger out. And then we can release our man manifesto, which has already been written. So, yeah, there's loads going on with Pierre. Like I say, it's only um, we've only been going for six months. And we've already had interest from thousands and thousands of people. I know that because I manage the website, so I see how many people sign up to it every day. But one thing we need to be sure that we do is don't rest on our laurels. We can't say, because we've had a good start, we can you know just rest now. Yeah. We need to get our heads down and we need to keep continue work, working because um, I, this is just the beginning of a very long journey and we've got a lot of hard work ahead of us. Well, we've been having a, a ripper of a, a, a chat. I've completely lost track of the time. We've already been going an hour and 40 minutes, and obviously we've had a, a consistent audience, so they're liking it uh, uh, as well, but I'll try not to go uh, too long. Uh, my next question is, uh, uh, obviously uh, there, there has been uh, various uh, women uh, over the, the last decade who've uh, been involved in nationalist politics being... Uh, per personalities and the, the ones that have gained the, the, the most popularity of uh, what have become known as, as trad thoughts. So Lauren Southern, for example, we have one in Australia called uh, uh, Sydney Watson and there's another one who's emerged in the United States, uh, uh, Caitlin Bennett, where obviously because they're young, uh, fit, attractive women, they get a lot of eyeballs quickly, even I, 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 even though what they say might be similar to what a lot of other YouTubers uh, are saying, you clearly don't give up, give off that uh, that vibe. I mean, for example, uh, I'm not aware of uh, any photo of you in a skimpy outfit holding a, a rifle. Yeah, that, <laughs> I'm not sure how good that would look, to be honest. But um, yeah, I, I don't go on camera, so I think that's why I avoid the whole trad thought thing. Um, and from the start, I just tried to be very serious and not make it about me, but make it about the issues that we were discussing uh, as a community. And I think because I don't go on camera, uh, I, I managed to avoid the whole trad thought thing. I just I, I never get it ever. I think I've had maybe two or three comments in three years. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, if, if women are bringing people to the movement by going on camera because they're attractive, then I don't really care about that. I think that's a good thing. If they're managing to entice men in, men in and women in, because women are attracted to women in the sense that they see them as something they can relate to, then I don't see what the issue with that is. I think that's a good thing if we can bring people to the movement. But it's just not for me because I don't, I don't like the attention. Um, I'm quite introverted and I feel a little bit too exposed when I, you know, I'm on camera talking about me as 
an individual rather than Britain and the issues that we're facing. If I do a stream with Mark and it's about PA, then I will go on camera because I feel like it helps me be a little bit more approachable, you know, for people to just see a normal face. But um, yeah, it's it's just not for me, <laughs> the whole trap thought thing. I just don't like it. Uh, what, what do you say to, because oh, the uh, uh, my partner in the the Uncuckables program that we do the the, the XYZ they uh, they believe that uh, women shouldn't be part of the uh, uh, traditionalist movement they they should be at the at the home taking care of raising uh, raising children uh, they don't believe women uh, should have gotten the uh, the vote uh, obviously that's quite a Puritan position to 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 uh to take i'm not sure if you've had any of those people sort of comment or or message you but what do you think is the role of women in the the distant right or traditionalist uh politics well i believe in uh, the traditional family unit so i think that men should be fathers and husbands and women should be wives and mothers um, that's something that I've always wanted. I'm currently engaged and we're going to get married this year. We're just waiting for the coronavirus lockdown to lift so that we can book a date. And then we'd like to have uh, a few children and I'd like to be very hands on with those children uh, and homeschool if we can do that financially. And if we're still able to homeschool, uh, because I think the government are trying to stop it. But um, I do, I, I don't want to force any woman to do something that she doesn't want to do. But I think if you look at the happiness trends of women from the 1950s to today, the happiness of women is dropping. And in the 90s, uh, there was a huge study done on, I think it was 30,000 American women. In the 90s, the happiness of men actually went above the happiness of women for the first time. And the happiness of women is continuing to drop. And we have to ask ourselves why, like there's all these diversity quotas saying women need to be in the workforce, women need to be in STEM, in the STEM sector. Do women actually want to do that? Or are they just forcing themselves to do it or being forced to do it because everything has to be 50-50? And I think a lot of women are actually happier being a wife and being a mother. And I think a lot of women only work because you need two wages to run a, a home nowadays so I would like the options to be made available for women to be stay-at-home mothers if they want to do that again I'm not forcing women to do it if you want to go and be a doctor be a doctor but the option should be there so that you don't need two full-time wages to be able to run a one-bedroom flat in London do you know what I mean so with me uh, I am very family orientated and not just with the goals that I have of having my own children but I, I love to spend time with my grandma and my mom and my niece and stuff as well uh, that's the goal that I have but I also feel very passionate about Britain and the stuff that I'm talking about, it's not because I want attention or money, it's because I genuinely care about the stuff that I'm talking about. And I think with Patriotic Alternative, when you have somebody like Mark, who is uh, very intelligent, very experienced and very driven, when you have somebody like that who's been attacked by the media for 20 years, to have a woman at the side of him who's a bit softer, I think that's fantastic optics. So I think that women can be a very useful tool for softening a movement and attracting not just men who think, uh, you know, she she looks all right. I'm not talking about myself there, but, you know, like attractive girls like Brittany Pettibone, and Lawrence Southern, etc. Uh, but also women, because if we are going to change something in this country, then we have to remember that 50% 50 of the population is female. And it would be fantastic to have their support. And it's also good to have positive role models for women. Um, so, you know, look at people like um, Lacey Lynn uh, and Critical Condition, who are both wives and mothers. It, it would be great for women to look up to them and, you know, see them gushing over their babies and stuff and think, oh, I want to do that too. So, yeah, I think there are uh, definitely roles for women in the movement. And I'm uh, the deputy leader of PA, so I don't think I'd be comfortable in the actual leader position. I see my role as more of a supportive role to Mark. But um, I think you can do both. You know, I think you can have children and a family and stuff and, and also have a career. I mean, ideally, I'd like to work um, maybe not like at the moment I'm working maybe 70, 80 hours a week. It would be good to minimise that down a little bit. Uh, obviously, I won't be able to do that when I have children, but I'd still like to be involved. I'd like to make videos and, and write and stuff. I, I think you can balance it out and do both. Definitely. Well, we're seeing uh, actually thanks to the the mainstream media's uh, hit job with uh, the the mini series Mrs. America on Phyllis uh, Schlafly, uh, who during the sixties and seventies in the U.S. defeated the 
the Equal Rights uh, Amendment. She was able to be an activist while being a wife and mother and also a grandmother uh, as well. Her Eagle Forum uh, lives on as well. And over in the US, Michelle Malkin, she's able to be a, a mother of two boys and still do her activism and writing as well. Yeah, definitely. And and I have a very active mind. I like to be thinking. Everyone calls me the statistician of patriotic alternative. I like to keep my mind active with, um, you know, stuff, stuff that's going on. And I like to share my opinions on it. So you can do that and still be very family oriented, definitely. And this is it's not a new thing. I mean, even uh, we mentioned Oswald Mosley very briefly recently when he uh, campaigned under the BUF, he stood more female candidates than uh, any other party and the reason that he did that was because he um he wanted mothers out there representing mothers you know rather than having a male politician or even a female politician who have no children making all these rules for schools and like daycare and and, and the home environment and stuff he wanted actual mothers to do that because they have the experience so i think that's a great idea and i think that we should have you know actual women talking about women's issues because they they have the experience in that area uh, Port Film Co-op uh, has got a follow-up question. Uh, hello, Laura. What are your views on on feminism? Well, we've seen, I know, in Australia, some some classic uh, feminist cringe on your on your media. Was that the sexist uh, air conditioning? That's always been a doozy. Yeah, it's. Uh, I've never called myself a feminist. Thank God. <laughs> I think a lot of people are feminists, and then they're like, "Oh, this is rubbish." And then they move over to maybe being anti-feminist, but I've, I've never been in that bubble. Um, but I just, I don't feel like it's it's about e equality, or maybe it's a, about equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity. But like I said earlier, I, I don't think that these women actually want to do what they're advocating for. You know, when they're saying, oh, we need, uh, we need, half of the government needs to be 50% male, 50% female. The reason why we don't have female politicians is because females aren't applying to be politicians because they don't want to do it. And we actually live, well, we're supposed to live in a democracy. So even if they did, it's the public who aren't voting them in because they don't want them to represent them. So it's not that it's not that someone's being unfair and only choosing all the men. It's just that they're not applying for those jobs because they don't want to do them. So I've never called myself a feminist. I, uh, I like the idea of uh, traditional gender roles and I, I don't want to be treated the same like I'm a woman I want to be treated like a woman and in my relationship between me and my fiance he's uh the leader you know he's the decision maker and that doesn't mean that I have to do everything that he says and that I can't disagree with something but I just like that he takes control of things and I, I think that women do like that and it feels more natural for me as well and also I, so I've heard women complaining before about um, having to do maybe a little bit of housework for their husbands or for their boyfriends. I like to do that for my fiance because I like to make him happy. You know, when he's had a hard day at work and he gets in, I like to have him a meal cooked or I like to have done his washing and ironing. Uh, and I work from home, so I have the time to do that, whereas he sometimes doesn't finish work until 10 p.m. And it's about a balance, isn't it? It's you're allowed to give and take different things just like he does the DIY in our house because I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. And that's okay. Everything doesn't have to be equal all the time. So yeah, I'm not a feminist. I, it's not something that I've ever pushed for. And I think it's uh, very dangerous. And I also think it's getting worse over the years. Feminism is getting worse and more derailed, to be honest, more mental. Uh, complimentary is, is what people... Uh, is the word that you're looking for to describe the uh, 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 male and female uh, genders, which there are two genders uh, we, 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 we should reinforce. Uh, uh, eth ethron, uh, uh, eth I'm terrible at pronunciation sometimes. Uh, their next question on entropy, it actually leads into my own question. We have got... I am aware that XYZ Live is going in, in 10 minutes, so I'll try to get through the, the last couple of topics uh, quickly. Uh, some people have criticised patriotic alternative for being too blunt to the point that a large amount of the nationalist vote are now opposed to uh, PA. Do you have any plans to moderate your image, uh, adopt uh, better optics? Because you are copying uh, some backlash from well, sort of the, the, the next gen uh, civic nationalists and, and some of the old guard as well. You shared a video from Anne-Marie Walters, who, who runs for uh, Britain. Uh, she's, she uh, failed to uh, 
uh, when the UKIP leadership a couple of years back, she started her own party. She described patriotic alternative as a gay-hating, woman-hating, black-hating uh, group. Yeah, that was a, a very emotional video that she put up. But um, d optics are important to a certain extent. So we can't go kind of like all guns blazing talking about certain events from World War II all the time because that's just a, a terrible approach. But I think what people are upset about is that a couple of weeks ago, Mark was asked to recommend three books that people should yes, read. Yes, I've seen that. And, uh... and one of the books... Yeah, one of the books that he said was Mein Kampf. Now, to be honest, I think this has been blown into something which was, who cares? He said that people should read Mein Kampf. I'm actually in the process of uh, making a, a video about 10 books that I think people should read in their lifetime. And one of the books I've included on that list is uh, British by Afwa Hirsch. And I've also included the Communist Manifesto. So it, there's nothing wrong with recommending a book. I mean, I know that Mark might have said some stuff in the past which is making people think that patriotic alternative is going to be a national socialist party or a fascist party but it isn't and when our manifesto goes public which will be after we uh, are accepted to be a party a lot of people are going to feel very stupid because we're not a nazi party or we're not a fascist party we're just a party who sticks up for the indigenous people of these islands uh, regarding optics I, I think we've all said stuff in the past that we probably shouldn't have said i mean I i've been involved now with PA from the start, so six or seven months. Before those seven months, I've said stuff that I wouldn't say now as a deputy leader of a potential political party. We've all done it because we didn't know that we were going to be in these positions. So what can we do? Go back and you know create a 1984 memory hole and get rid of everything that we've ever said. We can't do it. All we can do is learn from the mistakes that we've made, uh, the response that we've had from people about the mistakes that we've made and try to be better in the future. That's all we can do. But um, when you have somebody like Mark who has the experience and the knowledge and the drive and the passion that he has, you're going to have somebody who has said stuff in the past that they, that they maybe shouldn't have said. He's been involved with this in this for two decades and anybody who does this position has to be somebody who has that experience and every single one of us have said stuff that we shouldn't have said. So, I mean, I just want to clarify for anybody who's concerned, we're not a Nazi party, we're not a fascist party. Uh, those are topics that we're not going to be talking about. But, you know, maybe, maybe we've all said stuff that we shouldn't have said in the past, but in the future, hopefully people will... Uh, take us on what we're doing rather than, you know, just a book recommendation that happened a few weeks ago. Uh, Maddie Rose says, who's a uh, uh, co-host of the XYZ live stream, has said Davey is, is running late, so we can afford to go a few minutes over time. That's an internal uh, joke with our, our shows, Davey's late. All right, I'm not sure who that is. So uh, David to... Hiscock, he's the editor of XYZ. Right, you'll have to send us a link, maybe. I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> uh, Mark appeared uh, on an episode of XYZ Live. It was a couple of months ago uh, now. Uh, that uh, that was a, uh, another uh, Ripper episode. Uh, the The final topic I, I've got, because the, 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 the civic nationalists, they've been, uh, as I just said, uh, fighting back against uh, patriotic alternatives growth. But they're, they're, there's also, uh, who well, they they haven't attacked uh, you, uh, patriotic alternative uh, directly, but uh, they've attacked the the, the, the far right uh, uh, identity uh, identitarian ethno nationalist is the the intellectual dark web, which uh, I saw Mark po uh, posted a link to, to probably one of the the more popular uh, British uh, intellectual dark web programs, Trigonometry, where they had a former uh, far right. Uh, uh, activists on to discuss his uh, new book, uh, which will plug his new book. And the the two guys that 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 hosted, uh, I noticed they have changed this introduction now. But it's they 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 come across as basically they want to be the new elites. They don't like the current academia uh, uh, elites. They 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 just want to be the. The, the new elites and their their tagline is if you're tired of people uh, uh, on the internet arguing about things that they know nothing about this is your show uh, because we ask the experts well who are uh, the experts and that's just one show trigonometry there's Claire Lehman's uh, uh, Colette uh, which uh, it's it, it, it's basically a become an academic publication for 
or who they see as uh, as dissident uh, academics, and then there's also Brendan O'Neill's uh, spiked, and they 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 don't they they're too scared to go near issues such as demographics, which you are. They just attack identitarians, but they seem to think that the most stunning and brave uh, position to take is that, for example, uh, trans women are not women. I mean, they had that was that that. Posey Parker on their sh on their their trigonometry program. Labor activists are oh, stunning and brave that she said that uh, trans women are not uh, uh, real women. They seem to think that transgender people are the greatest threat to British society uh, <laughs> currently, which is an absurd uh, thing. They they are in their own bubble, it seems, and are also people who punch right. Yeah, these people are terrible. Uh, Mike Graham is another one as well. He He's like this shock jock journalist in the United Kingdom who pretends to talk about the controversial issues that nobody else will ever talk about. But then he'd never interview somebody like me or Mark because we're just way too controversial for him. Uh, this is why these people are getting griped. But trigonometry are just terrible. Absolutely terrible. They had Jack Buckby on who, who spoke about... Um, he used to be a far-right extremist, yeah, apparently. Yeah, he used to just have normal views and normal concerns that many millions of people have got today. And they're doing more damage than good. And I think they know that they're doing it, but they don't care because their priority is, I don't know, their own success or their own comfort or bank balance or something. But it's just this, um, it's like a funnel, isn't it? They're directing people's real concerns towards this dead end, which is just boring and irrelevant. And there's that other guy that does that Titanium McGrath parody account, you know, where they talk about like woke culture and it's just it's a bit boring and old now isn't it we want to talk about demographics and we want to talk about us becoming a minority in our own country and we want to talk about solutions but none of these people who pretend to be free speech um advocates none of them will talk to any of us at all uh, and you know I'm, I'm always very polite with people i never get into arguments or throw insults or anything like that i'd have a, a mature adult conversation with any of them but they won't talk to us and, and the same goes for other uh, leading figures on the british patriot scene such as uh, Amory waters tommy robinson N none of these people will speak to us at all and um, so yeah i don't know what they're scared of are you for free speech and uh, open dialogue and and real uh, conversations that's the tagline of, of dave rubin who's the the u.s host of the rubin report he has uh, ben shapiro and jordan peterson on and thinks that's real conversations so what was the latest thing he was interviewing dave rubin his husband about uh, the two of them meeting donald trump and gushing over him it was quite cringe yeah they're just terrible um i'm not really sure what else to add to it other than i just I, i'm not i don't learn anything from their <clears throat> from their content at all uh, I don't think they're tackling the important issues and I don't think they have any solutions. And, you know, you can say our oh, patriotic alternative are irrelevant. Why should we speak to you? But at the end of the day, half of you are making videos crying about us. And the other half don't seem to be aware that we're growing at an exponential rate. And like I said, we can't rest on our laurels. We still have a lot of work to do. But people are flocking to patriotic alternative. I get messages every day of people saying I used to be in this movement or this community. Or, I saw your gripers underneath this video and I, I've been to check out your website and I like what you stand for. How can I get involved? So you can ignore us all you want, but we got, we're doing well. We are growing. I've just got a, a super chat from Port Film Co-op and he says he wants me to, to sing it. Uh, Port Film Co-op is quite uh, eccentric. We On our shows, we, we have a lot of regulars who, 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 who like to sort of uh, give us a, a bit of banter and that. Uh, he, he says, sing this, uh, Timmy. It's Timmy time, Timmy time. Oh, it's Timmy time, Timmy time, then scream. Ah. I have no idea what that was. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's uh, three, three, three US dollars. He's a he's a filmmaker himself. Uh, uh, Port Film Co-op, as the as the name suggests, as they say, every every sort of uh, a genius is a bit eccentric. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, potentially, yeah. Um, so that was that an entropy message? A uh, super chat for three US dollars. All oh, right, okay. Well, thank you for the super chat. <laughs> I hope you don't want me to sing anything. <laughs> no, that's okay. He's only interested in <laughs> in uh, uh, giving me a bit of grief, that's all. <laughs> I've just been told that uh, David Hiscock is just putting some milk in his, his tea, so XYZ Live is about to to start. Thank you so much, 
uh, Laura, for, for joining me for the past uh, two hours. We've had a great, great, a great chat. We, we touched upon everything in, in detail as well, and you contributed uh, immensely uh, to the uh, discussion and enlightening myself and uh, my audience. And yeah, we can't wait for uh, to see when, if you're allowed out, I should say, uh, a patriarch alternative to, to start getting on the, on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm very excited for this year and the stuff that Mark and I have got planned and uh, all the other people who are helping us out as well and who have contributed with ideas. I think it's going to be a big year for us. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And just want to say thank you to everybody in the chat. I've been reading the comments. Thanks for being nice. <laughs> and thanks to everybody else who listened but didn't type anything. Yeah, thank you, everyone who uh, contributed to the questions and participated in the, the, the live chat as well. I'll be back uh, tomorrow night for Tuesday and Cuckables, 8.30 p.m. Melbourne time. And of course, for another Wilmstrand, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, Wednesday on the, the same same channel on YouTube and, and DLive. But uh, heading over to XYZ Live uh, tonight, I'll see you tomorrow. And thanks once again, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.